We will continue after this, so there will be activity in, around this area and other areas um, up and down the country for the next few days. Um, I'm really delighted to, to um, be welcoming this panel. Um, it's, it's been a, um, a lot, this particular topic has been a lot of work for the British Beauty Council, but it's going to be one of the things that I think we're the most proud of uh, in the coming years. So I'm going to hand over to Alice who is our moderator, Alice Hart Davis, our moderator. Hi. Um, and I'll invite Victoria, who's our Chief of Policy, Vivi, and Alexis, and Alexis, and Vivi, and Vivi, and Vivi, and Vivi, and I'm going to give Alexis to you, can have my mic. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, thank you, Millie. Fantastic to be here. Lovely to see all of you here. We think this is a really important subject, um, who is allowed to do what treatments to whom. Um, and I'm glad you all think so too. We want this to be a really useful um, session for you, so do think of questions that you need to ask that you will then are sparked off by what we're talking about, because there will be time for those at the end. And um, I think you've all discovered already the products on the seats, there are no bags because uh, we're being all um, thoughtful about not giving out bags, but those are for you, so, so grab them and take them, and there's some very nice stuff in there. So, um, before we get into the nitty-gritty of regulation, I wanted to ask our lovely panellists, what are the key trends that we're seeing emerging at the moment in aesthetics? I mean, I'm seeing a lot of radiofrequency microneedling in different areas. Um, Alexis, what about you? Yeah, um, I'm the same. I see the same. I think really the sort of um, trend towards a more natural, kind of understated approach is hopefully continuing. <laughs> We've been seeing more and more of that. I think one way that you can achieve very natural results um, when it comes to aesthetics is through combination treatments. So there isn't any one thing that kind of solves all the issues that you know a consumer or a patient might be after. Um, and so I hope that that continues. Another thing we had talked about is that, um, again, in trying to kind of um, get some of the more natural results, there are a lot of treatments out there now which we talk about are biostimulatory. So rather than you know freezing lines or freezing faces or overfilling, we look for products that um, stimulate collagen and elastin naturally. So things like hyaluronic acid skin boosters and polynucleotides. Um, and those, I think, have become very popular and will continue even um, in sort of rising. Thank worries. you. And Debbie, um, are you seeing more regenerative, um, more attention on regenerative treatments in your clinic? Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm very device-led in my clinic, so I'm always looking out for the next sort of um, device that's really backed by science. I mean, there's new things coming out all the time, and I don't necessarily like the hottest thing of the press because I like it to be proven. So I actually want to see that it's got a good um, good clinical studies behind it. It's been used long enough that we know what the long-term benefits or not benefits are going to be from it. Um, but exactly the same that's already been said, you know, uh, I started my clinic a long time ago focusing on overall skin health. So yes, I will treat people's concerns or what they consider imperfections, but for me really it's about how to get the skin as healthy as possible. And that means actually a healthy skin is, does look natural, but it has a glow to it, it's freshness, it works better. So a lot of the devices that are coming out now are really focusing on, rather than uber, uber aggressive treatments, it's punchy treatments, but moderated so that you have multiple treatments over a period which is much healthier and safer for the skin you're less likely to get the unwanted side effects so yeah we've got things like the radio frequency microneedling has been big over the last two to three years high has been massive over the last sort of couple of years as well and the biostimulators we're seeing them in the form of mesotherapy type treatments and the deeper injectables um, so, so they're all focusing really on the health of the skin and really stimulating the collagen, elastin, and um, yeah, just getting you all looking as fresh as possible. I was going to say that in terms of trends, I guess it's where the regulations come about. Because the trend has been definitely bringing down that kind of average age that people were seeking treatments, over the last 10 years that age has really kind of declined, that there's much more younger people Sure. Wanting to have those kinds of treatments, and that's led to this kind of huge explosion in demand where we haven't necessarily had the correctly qualified people to undertake mm -hmm. those treatments. 
and that's why we're here today. Regulation. <laughs> and, it, and it's a different uh, demand from that different demographic because when this area all started up, and I'm old enough to have been there at the very start reporting on it from you know 25 years ago, it was all about anti-aging. It was all about softening the impact of aging on a face. But you know the past 10 years, like you say, it has been beautification. It has been gorgeous young people who don't always know how gorgeous they are already, wanting to make themselves even more lovely. It's been amplified no end by Love Island, you know, so that it becomes more like a rite of passage. You know, girls think they have to have these lips in order to, I don't know, be attractive, you know, and, and yeah, so that has made for a very different demand from that different audience. Yeah, it's led to far more people springing up to fill that demand at a lower price. I think for me, when you talk about trends, I mean, there are a lot of treatments that have been around for a very long time, 25 years. Some of the lasers have been around for 50 years. Um, but I think people are just becoming much more aware of them. I think the trend is now to find available treatments to suit your skin and to suit what you're doing. So, you know, I'm still using some of the, um, the, the, the technologies that I was using 18, 19 years ago, and they are just as effective now, but people, some people are still not even aware that they exist, so they sort of come in, and almost to them it's a trend, because they're like, oh my god, I didn't know I could do that, this is great. So I think it's awareness, I think awareness of our Always. industry, yeah. and actually building the knowledge and letting people know what they can and can't have. And the media doesn't always help with awareness because, mm -hmm. I, I'm a journalist, so I'm, I'm saying that with a degree of self <laughs> because we seize on the new stuff, and we romp off writing about the new things and what it may have done for us with little regard to whether there is enough safety data behind it. I have learned over the years now not to go and try the newest thing to wait until it's reasonably well established. But would this be a point, Victoria, to look at what regulation exists already in the aesthetic sector? Chip in. Absolutely. So <clears throat> the simple answer is very little. Yeah. Um, from a, like a, a government regulatory standpoint, we have um, a new piece of legislation which only came in in 2021, but that bans cosmetic injectables for under 18s. We were part of trying to help get that through, which is fantastic, and we massively support that. But other than that, there's um, a special procedures license, um, which some um, clinics in London have to have, but that's not throughout the UK. And other than that, it's really just your basic hygiene and standard requirements that you'd have to fulfil as part of your local authority license, uh, your local yeah. authorities' requirements. So the, the simple answer is there wasn't anything, and that's kind yeah. of what's led to the situation we're in now, where there isn't really any kind of standardisation of education. There's no kind of mandatory and um, across the board inspection schemes, and so we've kind of ended up with yeah. this massive divergence in what is and isn't acceptable and the consumer just not really having any idea. Yeah, and the, like you say, that, that is the main problem. The consumer has no idea, because if you'll know, if you ask consumers, they will use potential patients, they will usually say, if you say, what regulation is there, or if you say there is none, they are always shocked because they feel somehow, someone, somewhere must be keeping an eye on these things, must be making sure they're okay. And to be told that it's not, that it's, that it's a free-for-all, um, is often very distressing to people. But We could do a quick poll on that. How many people here who've had treatments have, when you've, before you've had the treatment and you're kind of laying there in the bed or you've had a pre-consultation, actually asked your practitioner what their qualifications are and if they can show any proof of that? Well, look. And that's yeah. but, but yeah. your most prized possession, right? People always ask me, what qualifications do we ask for? I said, well... You know, it so depends because there are endless training schools um, which will train, some will only train medics, some will train anybody. Um, for lasers, you have an entirely different set of things you need to um, be able to show. You know, you really want somebody who's highly trained in the specific thing you're looking for and to have had enough time to put that training into practice to develop expertise with it because that's how you get the results. Um, so, so it's it's hugely complicated. I mean, that's so. I'm just looking to see what the other part of this question was. Uh, well, so that is why we need to work hard to, um, you know, keep the subject going, keep it all moving forward. Why this government consultation at the moment is so important. I mean, I, I found an article I'd written in 2001 the other day, which uh, was, you know, th this issue has been a live one f forever in the sector, um, and that was when the British Association of Cosmetic Doctors, which is now called BCAM, uh, was set up. And my article announced goodbye to the cosmetic cowboys, 
And I looked and thought, wow. And this was all about how there will be regulation because, you know, and it's exactly the dis discussions we're having now. But back then, it was a tiny, tiny niche industry, and hardly anybody knew about it. And it wasn't judged enough of a problem by anyone to ever accelerate it. So this is the first time um, that we've actually got this far. So that's why I think it's really important to keep it moving forward. I think it, oh, sorry, I think it's just really interesting as well because we set up a new medical office a few years ago and in order to do that, there are so many I mean, hoops upon hoops that you have to jump through um, with an agency called the CQC, which regulates all medical and dental practices. And they will come and inspect, um, but literally ignore anything you're doing that's aesthetic. And it is, so they'll look at everything but the aesthetic aspect. Um, and I just thought that was such an interesting and sort of odd way of regulating medical practices um, because arguably, and I'm sure we'll get to this later, but a lot of those procedures do come with some risk. And it is interesting that there doesn't seem to be, as we said, sort of any standardized oversight. And you have to be CQC registered if you are doing procedures that are breaking the skin or more invasive than injectables. So things like threads, uh, for yeah. example. Yeah. But even to, to give a dermatologist, so a dermatologist, and even to do a dermatology consultation about acne or eczema, you need a CQC, you know, registration. But yet to, you know, administer dermal fillers, you don't. So it does, again, it's just, there yeah. isn't a whole lot of linear thread going and around actually, between that. Actually, at the moment, the thread isn't under CQC, but that's one of the. Um, it's one of the proposals underneath. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So and the red, amber, green categorization of what will become potentially yeah. the new system, the red one would be the, a requirement for CQC registration there. So that's right, hopefully yeah. okay. those, those really higher risk ones with that potential to do real harm yes. would be. And, and something like PDO Fox and Threads, it's madness that it hasn't been to that today and that's definitely something we'd support. Because lasers used to be CQC and then it was taken off in 2010, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah I mean, in terms of um, regulation the, the people that are actually regulating the industry at the moment are actually the insurance companies and mm. um, they're the ones that kind of have their um, standards of what they want people to be trained to before they will insure them legally you're meant to have insurance before you carry out these treatments there are a few insurance companies out there who will insure people i think who have more questionable um, qualifications um, but if you go to any of the good insurance companies, they, they do want to see that everyone performing the treatments are correctly, um, uh, you know, sort of educated in what they're doing, that they do have some kind of um, experience, that they are trained in each specific aspect. You know, if we every new laser I get, I have to get every single person working with that laser trained up and certificates to show that they've had that individual training. So, but that... Like I say, that there are insurance companies that will insure it, and there are people working uninsured, and that's that's the that's the concern. And the one thing that is restricted, technically in law, is the toxin relaxing, relaxing toxins, so Botox and other toxins, um, can only be um, prescribed. They're prescription-only medicines, so they should be prescribed by a medical professional. So, as prescriber, doctor, dentist, surgeon but then it can be administered by people with a supervising doctor, but that gets stretched. So the whole thing becomes, becomes really tricky, doesn't it? I mean, Debbie, so as a practitioner, how are you preparing for licensing? I mean, I mean, you're incredibly thorough. I don't feel there will be much extra that you need to do, but what have you got to, to what might you have to attend to in your practice to meet, um, the demands of the new suggested proposed regulations if they go through as they are? Um, I'm not sure we can do much more. As a clinic, we are very, very, very conscientious of doing the right thing. And we always, we're already in Chelsea and Kensington in London, so they have some licensing in place already, which is loosely based on the QCQ sort of stuff and the old laser licensing that was um, in, used to be um, there for the government. So we already follow a lot of that. I mean, for me, I think it's base qualifications. I think that a laser qualification should be something that takes a good amount of time to do with lots of experience required and case studies required and a real understanding of all of the different technologies. Um, 
I actually didn't do that when I originally started. I've worked with lasers now for 18 years, so my experience is very much hands-on. But I see so many people, you know, they're given a new machine and they don't even understand really the premises of what a laser is. And I can show anyone how to switch a laser on and how to shoot it at someone's skin. But if you don't have that really amazing base knowledge, um, so for me, it's sort of making sure that any staff I have do get um, qualifications that are relevant to the type of treatments they're going to be doing. Yeah. And Alexis, I mean, as a dermatologist, you already have a regulatory body that you are um, overseen by is kind of the wrong word, but, but you know, you were responsible to, should anything go wrong, should people complain? And this is the mad thing, that somebody like you is already very closely um, observed in what they're doing, and there are a series of things around it, whereas um, other people are not, who don't have anything like your qualifications. Um, as well as the proposed license for practitioners, there's a license for premises as well. Um, do we know what that might involve? The actual terms of the license are still to be set out, but the, the basic premise of it will be around a potentially annual license, which will be both on a practitioner and the premises. And there will be certain requirements that the practitioner and the person who owns the premises have to fulfill in order to gain that license. And that will be proof of a level of competency via some kind of accredited government standard, mandatory insurance, and then an inspection of the premises. Um, but that's very, very loose at the moment, and there's still so many definitions and kind of things to iron out with sure. that, that I think it's kind of too early to tell, and it comes to your point, Debbie, of how do you prepare as a salon for this? Mm -hmm. What it's trying to do is create a level playing field so that whether you've gone down a medical route or whether you've gone down a non-medical route, we're working at a standard where everyone can agree. Level of competency is fine for this particular procedure, level of competency is fine for this particular procedure. Actually, these ones shouldn't be performed by anyone than a medical expert. Um, and that's really what we're, we're trying to determine here. But until such time as that comes in, which is probably going to be in two, three years, we just yeah. don't know. And there will be a time from the regulation going through to a, an enactment period where yeah. the government <laughs> will give time. time isn't it? Yeah. Exactly like you yeah. say, because we, I mean, standing here now, sitting here now, we don't want this to come tomorrow, but we've got to build a new education standard. We've got sure. to train local, mm -hmm. local, local authority enforcement officers. There's such a big piece of work mm -hmm. to be done here that I don't think we could have ever expected when we got the um, ban on injectables for under 21s that we'd be in the position we are now to be having these kinds of conversations that further regulation is coming. And it's absolutely needed, but in reality we can't do yeah. it tomorrow. We've got so many things we need to sort out. And that's not me trying to kick the can down the road. It's me saying, if we're going to do this, we've got no, to do no, it properly. It's got to be done properly. And it is all fundamentally about patient safety, isn't yeah. it? I mean, that, that is what we or ideally want. I mean, Alexis, is there anything else you want, want to add on this? Yeah, it was just, well, sadly, so I am, um, so all doctors are subject to, as you said, a regulatory body who we uh, report to every year. We have an appraisal and assessment every year. And, you know, sadly, the field of dermatology hasn't come that far from when I did my training like 20 years ago. So there's never much of an update on that, but there's always a massive update on the different types of procedures I'm doing, what I've learned, what I, my goals are for the following year. And so I think that um, it is important to, to get these you know, re regulations in place, but at the same time, you know, this is a field that, that ex just explodes every year upon year with new technology, whether that's for the good or not. But, um, and so I think that whatever regulations or scheme comes into place, it's gonna be really important that that is able to take um, into account the fact that there's all these new treatments yes. and new technologies that are going to continue to grow, and so it has to grow with that, yeah. if you will. Can I pick that with with new and emerging treatments? Because obviously yes, that's your bread and butter. Like you, you, as a yes. journalist, tweet yes. guys, yes. you are reviewing and kind mm -hmm. of giving opinion and insight and intellect and knowledge on the good and the bad <laughs> and the education <laughs> around that, yes. so that people go in with their eyes wide open. Mm -hmm. So why do you feel that that's kind of been <clears throat> your life's mission in a way to? give that level of education, there must have been something in you that said, okay, there's some potentially dodgy territory here, or it's a minefield or a rabbit hole, whatever, you could go down so many different avenues in terms of the different sure. treatments. What's made you decide that education of these kinds of things is so important? Um, it's, it's just such a terrifyingly complicated area. Mm -hmm. Even if you're in it the whole time, in the thick of it, going to the conferences, um, working on this on a daily basis, there is new stuff the whole time, and it's quite hard to keep up. So. 
for a consumer who is that potential patient in this area, I can see it's massively confusing. So what I'm trying to do is explain what these things are and just trying to get people to stop and think about it before they see a celebrity talking about a treatment and rush off to have it because she's having it. You know, I get, I get these questions endlessly on social media. Should I have Morphe's Faith or Profilo are the two that people chatter about most? They're not particularly any better than anything else in their respective um, product classes, but because they're the ones people have heard of, that's what they want. Can I tell them whether it's a good idea for them? You know, no, I'm, I'm not qualified to in any way, but also I can't see their faces down the line. You know, the only thing I can do is tell them to go and find somebody who's really good at it and get a proper opinion. But I want to try and explain to people because these things have become so much more popular, as we were saying, than they used to be. So more people are aware of them. There used to be this tiny niche that was only for the super rich who knew hospital dermatologists, that's where it started, who had these lasers or who had these collagen injections, that's what it was in the old days. Um, and then it started to expand, now it's reached the younger demographic, it is everywhere. And with that has come this sort of attitude that somehow these are the lunchtime procedures, that it's a casual thing, it's a beauty treatment, and they're not, you know. These treatments all have cosmetic effects, but they are essentially, most of them, medical treatments with cosmetic effects. So they should be, face doesn't show much has happened, but stuff has gone on, you need to acknowledge that, and, and any decent practitioner should warn you. Um, but because I'm in this area, and we, we all tend to rush about doing things in a more casual way than I would advocate for anybody in the real world. Um, is, that, is that answering the question? I, I feel a need to explain. People need to take these things seriously. They are much more widely than they used to be, and, um, but they shouldn't be taken too casually, and, and that comes back to why we're all so keen that there should be a way in which consumers can tell that a practitioner has a license, their premises have a license, therefore they're a good person to go to, because at the moment, because nobody talks about this stuff, that's the other thing, it's all still a bit secret. In the aesthetics world, people will say, oh, it's out there, everybody's really open about what they have done, but you think they're really not, particularly the older generation, you know, at a, a human level, they might say, I had a little something done, but they'll be a bit coy about it, you know? They aren't going to actually tell you. You know, these celebs will talk about one thing. They are usually having everything, the entire smorgasbord of things. Um, and the ones who will only say they, they use olive oil or, or have taken up deep breathing. <laughs> you know, they're lying through their teeth. They have help with their clothes, with their hair, with their exercise regime, their diets. Why do we somehow presume their faces just happen by magic anyway, I'll stop ranting. No, I was just going to say, another point that we kind of haven't alluded, alluded to much here is that if you're going CPC, so you go and see a medical practitioner and something was to go wrong, you've got an, an opportunity to have some kind of redress there, so you can For go sure. and yeah. report that if there's malpractice or something's been gone horribly wrong. There's, there's repercussions and there's investigation that takes place to make sure that that person's at a level of competency that they should continue to practice. If you're going to somebody that isn't medically qualified and something should happen that is an unintended consequence or they have a bad reaction, Good at the you. moment that person can continue to practice the next day whether or not they're competent. And that is c categorically not okay. And that's yeah. whether that's because they don't have the appropriate level of insurance or they don't have that opportunity to say, okay, I've had an adverse reaction or this person's not behaving in a correct way, I need to report it to X. We need that facility regardless. And then that will create such a better level playing field and give that consumer confidence, which I just think is exactly what we need. Yes, and with fillers, which can be injected by anybody, as, as, as we know, if something goes wrong with fillers, if there is a vascular occlusion, if that filler is injected into a blood vessel, which can have very dire consequences, it needs to be treated immediately. So somebody needs to recognise that's what they've done. And these things happen the whole time. You know, any practitioner who tells you they have no complications, they're either lying or they don't do enough treatment. Because these things do happen, even to the very best. I mean, you know, all your colleagues yes, will, will say that. Yeah. And so what needs to happen then is that blockage needs to be dissolved with hyaluronidase, which is a prescription product. So if this is a beautician who has injected you and doesn't have access to that product, 
that's a problem. And just saying go to A&E doesn't always help because A&E is not trained in recognising certain complications, let alone dealing with them. Why should they be? They are so busy otherwise. So it's difficult. And it's I was going to say also, I think, for certainly it protects the consumer um, or the patient, you know, to have sort of standards and regulations in place. But it also really helps the practitioner, too, because as we're saying, there's so many new things on the horizon. And it's also really helpful for us to be able to um, have a place where we can report incidents or complications or get support from others. And right now, that there are a few organizations that offer that, but it's nothing, again, that's standardized. And I think that to have that and to be able to understand, you know, if there's a filler that, you know, maybe isn't appropriate for X, Y, Z, then I think if we have regulations in place, it will just help to, to get that knowledge out more easily, like within the industry, essentially. Thank you. I mean, my thing on medic versus non-medic is probably slightly different. I don't do Botox and fillers, as you know, and I do stick to my, my realm. Um, however, a lot of the um, negative effects from these treatments I have seen have been from medically trained practitioners mm -hmm. who are mm -hmm. medical, but they are not trained in aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And it is a completely different thing. You can yeah. be you know, a GP, you can be a surgeon, you can be a dentist, you can be, you know, anyone. If you're not trained in fully in how to administer the actual treatment itself and how to deal with the complications that can arise from that, which means doing lots of case studies, it means seeing these things in real life, it means hands-on experience before you are allowed to go and actually sell your um, sell your goods, let's say. So I sort of think that, you know, people automatically say, oh, if they're a doctor, you're going to be safer. Actually, that isn't the case if they're not trained competently. Yeah. That's the start, isn't it? That's the start. It, 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 it's a small thing of it. I mean, you yeah, know, whether therapists, the whether therapists yeah. should do these treatments, I'm, you know, I'm always on the fence about it. But whoever does it, whether it's coming from a medical background or not, there should be a level of training that is a thousand times better than what we have now, and that is the problem. I 100% agree with that, and we've been really clear, clear to make that point. We're not here to demonise any, any particular area of this industry. We're just here to create a standard that everybody can work to, that it's clear across the board that that's a level playing field. But 100%, whether you're medical or not, you need to be trained in that specific procedure that you're offering. So we've been really clear in the, in the council's response to the consultation. Absolutely, medical practitioner for these things, but they have to have the specific it's training of what they're doing. And, and, and it, training and then, and then put it into practice. Yeah, because of I, in all this time, I've been looking at this area, no practitioner has ever said to me they got worse with practice. You know, <laughs> so, funny that. so if you want somebody, make sure they've done a lot of it, you know, whatever their original training, you know, if, if they've done an awful lot of it, they're probably, and then that's their expertise, it's probably because they're really good at it. But Victoria, can I ask you about the role that the council has had in this, what the British Beauty Council has done, because you've done an awful lot of work in this area. Well, we've just been working as closely as we can with DHSC and a number of other stakeholders, the Joint Council for Cosmetic Practitioners um, and others, just to try and make sure that we are, we're not here to speak as industry, we're here to speak for industry. So. I need to make sure that whatever I'm saying is reflective of you know every single person in this room, whether you're a consumer or a practitioner, or whatever, and um, and reflect that back to DHSC to make because to be fair to them, they are also not experts in this field. No single one person is an expert. We need a collective of everybody that's relate involved in this industry from whichever platform you come from, and that's what we try and do as the councillors to kind of be that mouthpiece to say this is the opinion and actually be constructive with it rather than critical or just raising problems but not trying to find solutions. So that's what we were trying to do when we were helping with the um, fillers, with um, band fillers for under 18s. And that's what we're trying to continue doing now as it kind of rolls through, is just be that kind of friendly voice and friendly ear to government and also to industry to kind of be that intermediary between the, the two, that we're not talking down to industry, we're not talking down to government, we're just being that person that they can both rely yeah. on. And I think it's a, been a very useful role because there are so many different interest groups mm. in this area. It's, and we're not um, paid by any of them, so that's, that's no, no, where we're helpful. No, but, but just, it, There's it, so it, many trade We're never all going to agree exactly. on everything, but somehow, we're not, Professor yeah. Science, you, everyone is, inching it forward it, it is getting there and 
the licensing consultation. You know, it gives that opportunity for so many things to be discussed. And as Alexis was saying, you know, this is an area that's constantly morphing and expanding and new things coming in, so it needs to remain flexible. Um, Millie, how are we doing for time? I'm, um, we could talk all afternoon. <laughs> and, and I just, no, I think we should do a Q&A would be really interesting. Yes, right now. yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, that good. will be... Should we also say that we... Oh, but what's your top tips for someone seeking aesthetic treatment? Red <laughs> yeah. flags. I was right. going to say, we should also mention that we, we had... Um, Someone from DHSC say that they have had eleven thousand responses to this consultation wow. today, wow. which is absolutely. Woo! I've been in policy in public affairs for eighteen years now, and I've never heard of a consultation have that many responses in anything wow. that I've ever done. And um, so that is really shows you the strength of feeling on this. So that doesn't mean that anybody in this room that intends to respond and hasn't done shouldn't do. Please still respond. Oh, please, because it's so important. It's not tomorrow, tomorrow no, at yeah. yeah. But all I would say is this is just the first step of a journey. There's there's no way that this is the end. There's going to be further consultations on what these education standards should look like. There's probably going to be other various um, roundtable stakeholder groups, etc., where we'll be needing feedback and input from, from people. So I'm always around. Please feel free to bother me. And these amazing people are always helping us as well. Sorry, can I just add, I think there's been a lot of confusion over the, um, the colour scheme, so the red, amber and green, mm -hmm. in terms of what goes where. Um, Obviously, I so does everybody know about this red, amber and green traffic lights? So, okay, do you, want, do you want to say a little bit about what that is? And just the, 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 the level of treatment and how much regulation will be needed for you to perform it. So e.g. the reds are all going to be um, medical only, the ambers will be maybe needing some um, medical overseeing and then the greens will be available for sort of everyone to do. And when you go into the consultation, obviously there are certain things in different groups I think that perhaps people feel shouldn't be there. It is a consultation, things can still be moved, and actually it's your opinion by actually going on there and, and saying what you think should be where and how it should be done that's going to help create the end result of this here. Um, there are some things that are sort of in amber that I have been personally doing for quite a number of years <laughs> without any um, um, overseeing, um, and they, they should be in green probably, but you know, not everyone understands every aspect of this industry, and it's so massive that it is a, just, you know, there's, there's so much going on. So really, this is just the start. Yeah and get involved, give your opinion, and hopefully by giving your opinion, then we are able to bring it more and more in line of what, what it should be. And there might be things in there where the terminology isn't quite right for particular treatments, or we've had um, been working with the British Medical Lys the Laser Association um, on the terminology around how lasering is talked about in the consultation. It's not quite right at the moment. It's, again, kind of being that critical friend of they're not saying that they've got everything right, DHSC, in the consultation. That's the point of a consultation. Tell us what we haven't quite got right here. Tell us where we need to look further. Tell us what needs more investigation. If you want to give us an opinion of what you think a um, medically qualified practitioner should be, then make a suggestion on what you think that terminology should be. What should that definition, definition be? <coughs> they're here to hear from you. So, yeah, absolutely do that. Alexis, you like you were about to say yeah, something. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, um, echoing what you said earlier, I think about, you know, education and experience are a huge part of it. So it doesn't always matter, I think, like your exact background, whether you're a medic or, a, you know, an aesthetician. I think it does come down to experience and training. So if there is a way to standardize that and say you need to have done X, Y, Z courses and this amount of, you know, practice or whatever it is, I think that we could definitely shuffle around some of the, um, you know, the red, amber, and green options because some of the best people that perform, you know, those treatments, as you said, are, are not medical professionals. Yeah. And it's all about raising the wider reputation of the industry, isn't it? Because I know I write for all the papers and they still tend to think that this is an area full of, quotes, dodgy doctors, dodgy practitioners <laughs> doing um, weird stuff with strange things. I was trying to raise an issue with one of the papers I write for about practitioners who are using a product that is actually illegal under UK and European law. And I cannot get them excited about it. I think that's only because they think there's so much malpractice of various sorts in the industry, lots of stuff going wrong. Sorry, I've been talking all day and I'm slightly losing my voice. <laughs> <coughs> 
that they simply weren't interested. I need to find a better way to present it. But yeah, raising the <laughs> reputation of the whole industry would do us all good, I feel. Uh, when, when I say what I do as a, as a job, um, I often get laughed at because you know, people think this, this stuff is sort of inherently ridiculous, which we all know it's not. It's a yeah. massive, massive industry. And it's changing people's lives. I mean, you guys do that every day. It's something to be super yeah. proud of. And you're touching people in a way that they may not have been touched for, I haven't had that human contact with somebody for quite some time. It's something really special that you can do for somebody. And like yeah. you say, it shouldn't be disregarded in the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And at the council, that's 100% the point of us. We're raising the reputation of the industry. We're professionalizing the industry. We're not powder and puff. We're actually a huge economic contributor. We actually do fantastic things. Do you think during COVID, how much people miss that touch and that interaction with your hairstylist or your beauty practitioner or your aesthetician or your doctor in a, in a, med, in a beauty sense that was something that people were writing about all the time during covid yeah and now yeah, we've got it back and the industry is booming but we just need to make sure that it's regulated to a degree where we're regarded as professionals that we are and the consumer is as safe as they possibly can be thank you um, questions that because you're mad <laughs> 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 you 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 have have drink. yes question so what are the, hi, uh, thank you for that talk. Uh, what are the three things that a consumer should be looking while choosing a clinic? And since it's so unregulated, so there is no formal education for the consumer as well. And also, how far do you think we are to hold them accountable if something goes wrong? Because every time they can just say, and get away with it, it's because of hormones or it's something else, and it's very easy for them to get away with it. Okay, firstly, aesthetic procedures are procedures that you are voluntarily having done. You do not need them. So they are aesthetic. So as much as you personally feel very um, upset if it doesn't work properly, or it, it, it's not a, a, a medical procedure in terms of life or death so there isn't that same kind of um, weight given to it I think so as the consumer you have to decide for yourself if you are going to have a cosmetic procedure to help with how you look which may have a massive impact on how you feel and how you live your life if it does work how's that going to make you feel if it doesn't work, how is that going to make you feel? And actually, if you have a negative reaction, how is that going to make you feel? Because that is the other possibility that you can get. So some of that responsibility has to come back to the consumer a little bit to, to be aware that things do not always work the same for every person. It's just genetically we're all very different, so you, people do have different reactions. Um, in terms of what to look for, I mean, we do have quite a strong tool now to get a, a reasonable idea of whether or not you should go to a place, um, the wonderful world of Google reviews. <laughs> um, you can normally get quite a good feel for a, a, a clinic through doing that. You know, if they have got a lot of reviews and, and the majority of them are, are positive or negative. Um, personal recommendations are always great. I, I also think as well, though, that I recommend to all of my clients when they come to me, you know, I always say to them, you know, if you leave the consultation and you don't feel happy that everything has been answered satisfactory, then you either need to come back to me with more questions until you do feel happy. And if you still don't feel happy, I'm not the right person for you. Mm -hmm. um, also, if I'm recommending my clients to go and see other practitioners, whether it's dermatologists or surgeons or because obviously I get asked a lot, I always tell them to go and see three people because I want them to make the decision of who they see. And when you meet people, sometimes it's a personal connection that you have that gives you the confidence to go through with that. Make sure they are insured. Make sure when you walk into the space that you feel comfortable in that space. I mean, there's, there's lots of things. You know, sometimes you go into a space and it looks amazing, but when you're actually talking to the practitioner, mm -hmm. you feel uncomfortable. And if you feel uncomfortable, it's probably not right for you. Um, the, the insurance factor is, is important um, in certain London boroughs and possibly some outside of London there is licensing in place. It's not great, but it, at least it is something that can give you that. I always like um, 
a place that has more than one treatment available for things. So if someone has multiple ways of treating a similar concern, that normally means they're going to recommend the right thing for you rather than just the thing that they have. So um, a, a good, you know, a good premises that has lots of different, a good business with lots of different options there, maybe a few different practitioners who can recommend to each other mm -hmm. and, and people that are also happy to say no to you. Mm -hmm. yeah, really I, important. What I was going to say, you basically said it, but it's pre-consultation. So you, they should be talking through the treatments and what the potential, the practitioner. So if you're going in and they're just wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, and you, be, work, be concerned. Mm -hmm. Go in and have that pre-consultation, then the treatment, then the aftercare. Aftercare is really important as well. Are they following up with you or the, your re potential, even if it's at the time, but a lot of um, more reputable ones, Debbie's, Debbie's Clinic does this, sends you an email afterwards reminding you of everything. Mm -hmm. If you was in a blur at the time, this is everything I said to you. This is all the possible um, after effects that you could possibly have, that kind of thing. And yeah, just that pre and post is really important and having that opportunity for a cooling off period so you don't just go in and go, oh, I'm just got all kind of whipped up in it, but you've got those couple of days, you think it's 48 hours to say, mm -hmm. yeah, this is actually what I want to do. Have I researched somebody else? Is there a treatment that's better for me here? That you're not just being sold something and going straight into it. Yeah, just say do your research um, and take the time and find out as much as you can about the procedure you think you're interested in as well as the person you're going to because everybody has an online presence these days. If people are just offer, operating on a Facebook um, account, that always worries me. Um, so true. Most <laughs> reputable places will have a basic website because uh, for, for all sorts of reasons, just an Instagram page, uh, as well maybe you know but at least there you you can usually then start to see their work that will give you an idea of whether um it's all lips and lashes or whether there's a, a range of stuff you know, everything debbie said i absolutely agree with uh, personal recommendation is great but, but you want to check them out for yourself rather than taking other people's um other people's sort of word for it or or to all sort of too many social media reviews that just want to say the same thing this was fab, you know, you think, are these bots <laughs> or what? You know, I, I have a website which puts out a lot of information about treatments that people can find, that's called the Treatments Guide. You know, I list practitioners who I think are good, that's a, that's a sort of personal recommendation thing rather than a, everybody who does everything, which is what, where the licensing thing will be so good because it will separate things out. There is a, a lot called Safe Base at the moment. They, um, they go and inspect the premises which um, and, and, and practitioners, you know, they, they, they pay to be sort of checked out to see that they're practicing safely, that they're practicing safely. You know, all the, um, the surgeons, the dermatologists, the dentists, the doctors will belong to their industry body. You can see whether they are who they say they are. You can check whether a doctor has been struck off for malpractice in some way, which happens to some of the best known doctors uh, who get up to all sorts of sort of non-compliant things and it happens, so it's always worth checking them out just because they've been in the press a lot doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, as fabulous as they appear shiny, you know. So, uh, Alexis, did you have something else? Yeah, no, I think um, yeah. you really covered it. I think the cooling off period is really, really important. And I generally, you know, I some, sometimes patients, I think, come in and want to have something kind of right away on the day, and I generally will counsel that I do think it's best to kind of go home, have a think about it, um, and then come back. And I think one the point you made about seeking kind of um, recommendations from multiple practitioners is also really important, particularly for the more sort of higher stake procedures like anything surgical, anything more invasive. I think it's always good to get more than one opinion. Yeah. 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 One more question. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to the Bridges Boot again mm -hmm. for this is, I'm a static. <laughs> I've been in the industry for 40 years and we have been fighting and fighting and fighting to get some kind of recognition. Because it's all about, um, it's all dizzy and nails and hair. But it's now so out of control that we now need something there. And the fact that you've managed to get it there, let us be recognized, is not going to only, you know, protect the non-medics, the medics, but the consumers. They're going to be informed, they're going to be more happy about everything. And, you know, I think that everybody here should be positive about this consultation. 
at last we are being heard. Thank you so much, and as Amelia says, that's a really good note yeah. to end on. So, thank you so much to our fantastic panel, Victoria, David Thomas, Dr. Lex Granite, and thank you for listening with such attention.